Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and welcome to Fast Forward, where we have conversations about living in the future. We are in PC Mag Labs, we are recording this in the studio, and I'm very pleased to have Adobe's Chief Product Officer, Scott Belsky, with me today. We're going to talk about design, we're going to talk about UX, we're going to talk about some very interesting new products out from Adobe. I'm super excited to have him here. Scott, thanks for coming in. Oh, thanks for having me, Dan. So we've got a lot to talk about. Um, I want to start on a personal note, which is that we met, uh, actually, what was the year? Probably 2010, yeah. when you were on your book tour for Making Things Happen. Yep. Um, we had just we just met in, in your book tour, in your book launch tour. I, I shook your hand. I, signed, I got a copy of your book, which I still own. <laughs> Great book. Um, but you you know, were introduced to me, and at the time, you were running 90, 92. Um, 99 year. 99U, which is yeah. happening very soon. Yep. Um, and then. But you were a Goldman Sachs guy who moved over <laughs> to the creative industry, was running this community of creatives. Right. I remember there was always like a little dissonance there. It was like, how did he get from there, there to, to here? There. Right, exactly. So maybe just revisit that story. Sure. I mean, as an undergrad, uh, you know, back in, I graduated college in 2002. So as an undergrad, um, I was always focused on both business and design. And I kind of had like a bifurcated, you know, somewhat identity crisis, I guess, in terms of where I would go. Back then, if you were interested in business, you just kind of cut your teeth on Wall Street. That's what I did. Uh, I had a, a finance sort of typical job for a year and a half, and then I had to get out of there. And actually, my manager said, well, if you could have one other job here, what would it be? And it was in this other group in the executive office focused on organizational development, leadership, uh, leadership development and improvement, that kind of thing. And uh, it was during that role there that I kind of fell in love with this idea of organizing the creative world. And when I would tell my friends who were in the creative world uh, and who I knew from college about this you know, idea of helping people get their act together, they were always like, oh, you know, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. The creative world always prizes itself on its disorganization. But I just felt like with the growing importance and role of creatives and business and everything else, there was something to be said about not just always pushing for more ideas and creativity, but more execution and organization around the ideas we've already got, which was very much the genesis of Making Ideas Happen, the book, the conference, Behance, and has been probably the anchor for my career ever since. Yeah, it actually, it perfectly explains how you got to where you are today. Which is, of course, the chief product officer at Adobe. Adobe makes a ton of tools for creatives. Yeah. Um, and, you know, product is a term that gets thrown around a lot in the, in the tech world. Yeah. Um, and it means different things to different people. There's the, the concept of product, there's the concept of design. Yeah. Um, and, it, and maybe explain what it means to you and what it means to Adobe. Sure. Well, if you think about a, um, a, uh, a modern technology company today recognizes that um, maybe even more important than the, than the technology itself is the user's experience of the technology. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that there's a big um, journey that a company like Adobe and any other company that's been around for you know, 30 plus years in the technology space to, to understand really what that means. I mean, for example, the millions of people who download Photoshop who then open it and say, whoa, what is this? Mm -hmm. I mean, some people know how to use it, and they're experts, and they take pride in that. Um, but a lot of folks who want the power of a creative tool like Photoshop and then take the uh, initiative to get it don't know what to then do. And, uh, and that is a user experience problem. I mean, if you think about it, the first mile of the customer's experience across all of our products, there's so much opportunity for that to be rethought and to make creativity more accessible. So I think that um, when I think about product, I think not just the technology um, and not just the design, but also really thinking about you know, empathy with the customer's experience, where they are, who they are, how new cohorts of new customers are changing over time, and, uh, and building a team and a culture that can think that way. Yeah, it's funny, in the office, everybody thinks that they need Photoshop to do yeah. any photo editing, right. whereas if you've actually opened up Photoshop, you realize <laughs> you probably don't need Photoshop. Um, you need something else. Um, but I, I want to get to this point about the organizational aspect, because I think it's sort of unified your entire career. Uh, you said recently in an interview that you have a, per a deep personal desire to, quote, help creators get more organized and make ideas happen. So how do you go about that in your day-to-day -day job at Adobe? Well, I think, um, I mean, I think, again, big picture, um, I do feel like there's this guttural call to action for making better creative tools more accessible to more people. We're living in a world where labor is becoming increasingly commoditized and automated. Um, AI is supposedly going to do everything for us. And what is the most uniquely human trait that we will all kind of turn to to add real value, incremental value to the world? I think it's creativity. 
um, which means that the term creative professional is going to be a weird term in the future, where everyone's kind of trying to engage or uh, incorporate creativity into whatever they're doing. The non-creative professionals will be the automated professionals. I think that are, so. That are replaced by machines. I actually feel like the, 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 yeah, the real value creator will be creative by default, right? And, uh, and what company doesn't say that design and creativity isn't important to them today? Uh, even accounting companies are saying creativity is important to them. So there, there's a huge uh, opportunity there. So when I think about organizing uh, and, and, and outfitting creative people to make ideas happen, I'm thinking that, about that very expansively. I'm not just saying, hey, designers need to be more organized and take the reins in their careers, which was, frankly, the message eight years ago, 10 years ago, and I was uh, in the earlier days of this journey. Now it is, all right, like everyone needs to be outfitted to be creative. Um, creator, creative, uh, core creative teams within companies need to actually be working with their counterparts. Uh, why are this the advent of the prototype as an example? Um, the prototype is now shared with everyone and everyone gets to weigh in. The legal department gets to see the product before it ships. The C-suite gets to see the product before it ships. And in that construct, how do we have to build and design new tools you know, to, to, feed, to enable this world to exist? Um, and uh, you know, and then I also think there's a there's on the freelancer independent creative side. There's a sense of I don't know. Are the best creatives in the world now going to work in agencies or companies, or are they working on their own? Mm -hmm. And if they're working on their own, which is actually a flip of what it may have been 15 years ago, mm -hmm. right? What does that mean? What do we have to do for them? And so, that's a big question. So one of the answers to that question is a new product that Adobe is just coming out with, Adobe XD. Uh, tell me what it does. Tell me what, what's unique about it. Right. Well, I. Um, First of all, I'll make a kind of bold proclamation, which is that I believe that the field of experience design, and specifically Adobe XD, which is our big bet in the future of this field that I think will define life as we know it, and I'll explain that later, but um, I think this will be as big, if not bigger, than Photoshop. Uh, I, I think right now it is UI, UX design, it's thinking about web, it's thinking about mobile and apps and that sort of thing, but experience design will involve spatial computing, will, will, will involve augmented reality experiences, interfaces not only in the AR world, but also voice. I mean, this is all experience design. And if you think about the, the history of the creative industry and when people were stuck in the world of print, and they were using products that we made uh, as Adobe before my time, mm -hmm. and then they realized they had to kind of go digital. Some people got left behind and didn't take, make that jump, but most people did, and they started to create for web and then create for mobile, and our tools were the tools that helped them adopt this new medium, and so when I'm talking to the XD team today, I'm saying, hey, yes, we have to have the best industrial grade performance platform for experienced designers today. But when their clients start coming to them and saying, hey, I need that interface for this AR world. Mm -hmm. I need a voice interface. We've got to like help them. We can't just say, hey, use that tool. We have to really build our platform to support that. And so actually, under the hood, which I'm happy to talk about further, we're doing a lot to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, and it's been the transition. I mean, I'm in the publishing industry. I started off in print. I rose up through the world, the transition to digital. We moved to mobile, and we're like, no, I think the web page, as long as it's a mobile web page is optimized, right. I think that will work. But then you've got app development, and now we're moving into just basically how to take our content and put it on on, on platforms yep. and services. And XD is going to be is going to help us do that. Yes. Um, so in short, yes. Mm -hmm. And you know what is involved in in making that happen, right? There's a few different things besides just the raw. You know, industrial grade performance. There's uh, there there are questions like how do you manage asset flows across the workflow? So how do you have stuff in, in, in whether it's a product that we run like Photoshop or Sketch or some other third party product? How do you make sure it seamlessly works with XD? How do you make sure that all the stakeholders of the creative process, not just the designer, can work together? Um, which involves not only making prototypes in XD, but then how you share them and get feedback on them. And then the question around prototyping. It's always been like a, you make something in the creative tool and then you take it somewhere else and make a prototype that's like a static walkthrough. Mm -hmm. And actually what we've now found is that the best designers are thinking about prototyping as a design experience. I mean, it's experience design. So the animations, the gestures, like all of the feedback you get as a user needs to be developed in the tool. And so one of the big bets we made early on in the development of XD was bringing design and prototyping together. And it's unlocked a whole, you know, amount of innovation around animation and leveraging technology from products like After Effects, you know, bringing that in. So that you're going to see a lot more from that in the future. And then extensibility is another piece. 
we're not going to fool ourselves. We're not going to develop every solution that an experienced designer needs in the future, especially for some of these new mediums and verticals that emerge. So how do we, mil how do we really build this as a platform? And how do we you know, engage, um, engage uh, third parties you know, to build upon it? And um, so one of the things that we are announcing this will be live. In, you know, this will. This, I think this I, will be yeah, live, I can. Yeah. I can share this the now. The product with you. will be out by the time this airs. <laughs> Is uh, we're we're announcing a a ten million dollar fund for design to both through grants as well as through investments in the third party services and developers, independent and teams that want to build upon the platform. We're going to embrace them and even help fund them. So who would be? Give me an example of somebody that would would try and get some of that money with by building a service on the platform. Sure. So they could be uh, teams that are building better ways for designers and developers to work together. Um, workflow improvement teams. They could be um, teams that serve very niche players in certain industries, like media or whatever, where, where there are certain workflows that need to be supported. We may not build the tool. They might build the tool, and we want to make sure that that's, that's supported. Um, it could be companies that people actually deem as competitive to us, mm -hmm. that just want to make a better workflow for the sake of the designer's experience. We embrace that. Um, and also teams that are thinking about the future of AR or VR and how to take an interface and automatically make it you know, relevant and, and outfitted for that world, and we want them to embrace the platform as well. So, so instead of spending that $10 million internally with your own developers, follow, you know, running the plays that you know how to run, you're like, let's, let's let some other people run with this, and it will enhance the whole platform and add value to it. Yeah, and in order for us to deliver, by the way, on us adding value to them, right, not just for the customer, but I mean, we need to make it really easy for our customers to discover these extensions and third-party services, and so we're actually also innovating in how to enable that to happen within the product. Almost like, imagine you open up a, 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 a state-of-the-art creative product, and you make it your own mm -hmm. through all these other first- and third-party services and bells and whistles that you can integrate. Like, that's the vision. One of the things you mentioned earlier was that many more people would be able to see into the design process, into the prototyping process. Um, having worked with a fair number of designers myself, um, I know that there's a, there is a reluctance for a lot of, among a lot of designers to let people in when things aren't done, when yeah. they're not fully baked. And, and I've seen that work uh, to their detriment and to their favor. Like, yeah. uh, there's nothing worse than having an executive come in halfway through the design process and say, I don't like the way that looks. Yep. I think you should do it like this. And they have no design experience, no design sensibility often. Yep. And yet, they've, they're, they're distorting the process. I mean, is it, how do you protect against that? It's a really good point. You know, in, within our product teams, I talk about it. I use the term creative control. Mm -hmm. the, the, the creative at the end of the day needs to have control over his or her process. Um, some people... You know, the, if, it, it's so iterative, right? The design process is trying 10 different paths, realizing that eight of them were ridiculous and two of them are interesting and then pursuing those. And if you have a, a peanut gallery over, you know, overseeing what you're doing in real time, it's actually liable to really disrupt a proper design process. Um, uh, but there's times. Right, so we will in the future enable things like co-editing mm -hmm. in our products, so multiple designers can be in one document at once. Now, some people say that's crazy, you know. Um, other people say, "Hey, I learned design by being an intern next to so and so, mm -hmm. and literally being in his or her documents with him or her, you know." And, and this will enable me to do that wherever I am, and so it will unlock a lot of stuff. I think what we have to do is make sure that we protect the defaults as being in you know, preserving creative control. I think there's also part of the part of the creative work now. It's it's not as hierarchical as it used to be. It right. is more collaborative, and every department needs to know a how to do their own job, and they can have opinions about other jobs, but they also have to respect everybody's core talents. And it's just, but it's a it's a slightly different. The, the CEO may not always be right. Yeah. And we sort of have to understand, and he needs to know to trust his creatives. Right. Well, I think the um, when you think about the nuances of a product like collaboration and sharing, it's it's kind of fun to debate some of these. Again, the defaults, like mm -hmm. the devil's in the default, right? Mm -hmm. And whatever you give people, they will run with and use. And so, um, it, so is the default to share with everyone in your, in your team? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, and also, should you be giving everyone the same level of permissions in terms of commenting and, and what they can do? Can they mark it up or can only certain people mark it up? I mean, these are very thoughtful decisions that we need to make to protect the integrity of the creative process. Uh, that's part of the fun of the job is debating some of those things. I want to I get your, your comment, a couple comments from you on the state of the web in general. Sure. Uh, we've seen the rise of platforms. We've seen, uh, and, and we've seen in a lot of ways, uh, people are le spending less and less time on conventional web pages. And when you go to conventional web pages, Web pages, it's pretty easy to see why. Like yeah. the, the design experience and the UX experience on the web, the open web, in order to pay for all this free content has led to some pretty significant compromises. Um, what did we do to ourselves here? And is there a way that we can design our, ourselves out of this problem? Sure. 
It's a good question. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, design is certainly the solution. I think that with new mediums that come about, we'll start to, uh, to unravel some of those problems. I mean, still today, search on the web, Google, people go to, and then wherever that takes you, people engage. And then with something that you want to deeply engage with on a frequent basis, that's when you have an app, right? That's when you have something dedicated for that experience. But I do wonder, um, for example, I've been thinking a lot about the world of voice and AR. And I've been thinking again about that question of the defaults. When you say, um, when you tell Google you want something, you actually still get a lot of options. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yes, some of them are ads at the top, increasingly more maybe, maybe ads at the top, um, but you get discovery, you get visual discovery. When you say to a voice device, um, I want to buy batteries or I want a car, um, the who knows what's happening under the hood? Is it a Lyft? Is it an Uber? You know, are these Duracell? Are they Energizer? Are they Amazon batteries? Mm -hmm. Whatever the default is, is typically what we're going to engage with. And from a consumer perspective, wow, that actually is a great welcome sense of simplicity. But also, it's kind of scary. It's like, oh, so there's this battle to be the default now going on that emerges with these new mediums that actually didn't really exist as much on the web because there was visual discovery. It's a, it's a fun new world. As I think about it from the interface and design, experience designer's perspective, there's actually, uh, you know, it conjures up some good questions. Like what should the responsibility be of a designer to preserve some sense of choice? Yeah, I was just talking to Aaron Shapiro at Huge about this. Yep. Um, and we're talking about, he works in the world of advertising and, and the transition from the web where being on the first page of search results is really the most important thing. If you're not on it and you're not above the fold, then you're, you're, you're you, right. you basically don't exist. Yep. But when you roll, move into the world of search, you're not getting 10 search results. You may be getting three and then you have to trust the assistant. So mm -hmm. if you're in, a, in the Alexa universe, which I am, yep. and I have it all over my house, you know, when I ask for things, there's every reason to think that Alexa is going to be giving me, if I say, I, I, you know, I need a notebook, right. there's every reason to think that they're gonna give me an Amazon product right. and have it sent to my house. Yep. Um, and there's very little incentive for them to go to third parties. Yep. And that same dynamic is gonna happen in every aspect of our lives. 100%, and uh, AR is the same way, by the way. I mean, think about it, there's only a limited amount of real estate around you. Um, the web is a much vaster way of discovering and sorting and filtering and whatever else, but I don't know, like physical physical discovery is somewhat limited, just like voice. You and know, I hadn't thought about that. Like so, it, it's, it's, it really is, like you have a field of vision yeah. and you can't stack things. Right, right, and so it's, it's, yes, AI is bringing us these possibilities and it is exciting to think that you will get the best solution wherever you are, whenever you need it, but we both know there's a lot of vested interests in what is the best solution or the most profitable solution for us. And uh, you know, so just to bring it back to experience design, these are the types of challenges that designers need to play with and, and, and face and, uh, and test. Um, and, uh, and whenever I think about these problems, and I know I'm biased, but it always goes back to like the designer mm -hmm. at the end of the day. It's like, okay, the, the designer is gonna have to face this and solve this for us. So a lot of the, you know, we've tested all the VR headsets um, and, and, and all, most of the content that's available out there. The vast majority of it is gaming content. Yeah. It's being programmed by game designers. Uh, what VR or AR experiences have you seen that are not gaming related mm -hmm. that have really blown your mind? Gosh, well, I mean, on the, um, quickly on the VR front, um, and frankly, I am more excited about AR than VR officially. As am I. You know, yeah, but I mean, gaming and everything is amazing. I think being able to transport yourself somewhere else and have empathy in a way that you wouldn't otherwise through VR is very powerful. Mm -hmm. And so the experiences that have moved me on VR are ones that solicit some sense of empathy, right? Um, with a village that you're visiting and people that are going through something or whatever, that's interesting. On the AR side, I have seen a number of more recently, very practical and fascinating applications. Um, I mean, one example is um, you know one of our one of our customers, Adidas. You know, is, is is thinking about the future of AR with their stores, and you know one of the things our teams have been thinking about is, gosh, so what is the process of actually setting up a retail store? Right? You have uh, you place shoes and shelves and, and displays and whatever else. And actually, if you if you learn more about what goes into that, there are scores of people, teams third-party companies that you engage to make plans and then you know, build fake mock retail stores and warehouses, take pictures, send it to the field, have process checks and whatever else. And if you look at that current world and then you look at actually, well, if every object that you need to be placed to its exactitude was in a, uh, 
you know, a cloud repository and you just through AR like flick it wherever you need it to be and, um, and then you save it and then everyone else can just take their phone or whatever we'll have in the future mm -hmm. and just walk around and actually physically place things. Or sometimes you don't even have to, you can, the AR version's enough, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you start to see those two worlds compared to one another, that for me, that was a click. I was like, oh, you know what? This is all gonna be done in AR someday. Like, there's no question. And, uh, and I think we're gonna see a lot of enterprise applications for AR, actually, that we would not expect in that world. And, and then, it, of course, based on whatever our devices become, which is out of our hands. I like that we still call them phones, even right. though we very rarely make voice calls anymore. Yeah, well, listen, there's no doubt to me that this will be, we will be constantly doing this because the world will be more interesting and, and full of rich information until our hands get tired. And then, you know, we'll, 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 we'll all learn about some new product to save us the motion. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful place to be in. So uh, when I graduated college, I, I, had, I was a journalism major, but I had taken a desktop publishing course. Quark Express was the thing yep. um, at that point. And, um, and Quark Express, basically, the fact that I could update pages mm -hmm. helped me get my first job. Mm -hmm. So if a, if a kid is in school today, he's 21 years old, maybe he's going into media, maybe he's going into, into, into uh, computer science, but yeah. what program or skills does he need or she need in order to succeed in the world today? Other than expertise in Adobe XD. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, you know, and, and the, uh, being able to understand some of the principles of experience design are critical. And because uh, and I think that I mean, interfaces are ultimately how we make decisions in our world. And, uh, and, there, and as we discussed just previously, there's going to be more trickery mm. in interfaces than ever before. So becoming proficient in that to some extent, whether you're a designer or not, is, um, is I think, a part of essential education. I mean, one of the things that we are doing that you know, we're also uh, announcing you know, as this airs is we're making XD free. Mm -hmm. So this was a pretty you know, bold decision internally. Um, now, of course, there will be um, the collaboration stakeholder services that accompany XD that allow enterprises and teams to take it to the next level. We'll have a, we'll have a paid service for that, but the idea of taking the core tool with all its functionality and just making it free for everyone um, hasn't, as far as I know, been done before, uh, at least at Adobe. Um, it's, a, it's an important point because we want to like just outfit people in this language of experience design and interface design and just start to play. Um, it's a, just a great way of like visually expressing yourself. I'm actually using it now to even make my own presentations um, nice. instead of Keynote and PowerPoint because actually it's more visual and laid out for me. Um, in terms of other things that kind of the future generation should be thinking about to succeed in this world, you know, I think thinking about multiple mediums for a message, this notion of content velocity, it's, it was one day where we kind of made a page and that was it, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can't just ship a page. You've got to think about, okay, what's the implication for this content in web like this, responsive web, and app in infrastructure, how should this be represented in the 3D world potentially? Um, if it's just a dead asset, it's gonna look a little dead. I, have to, I feel like in the error world, everything's gonna be animated in ways that the real world isn't. Mm -hmm. So how do I actually learn those tools? Do I have to become an animator? Are there defaults in the product that allow me to be that way? You know, voice, you know, how does this show up on an Amazon? How do I make it terse and is brevity power? And you know, there's so many new questions as you start to be a multi-medium thinker. Mm -hmm. Also, how, do these, how does this media exist over time? which you know, we used to publish and put out and distribute. Yeah. And now it's like, no, these things aren't going anywhere. They have right. to, you have to plot in some kind of age, age for it yeah. and, and think about how it's going to evolve over time yep. and whether or not it holds up. And attention, the battle for attention. So you're obviously focused on, speaking of attention, um, the creator side of it and, and empowering creators to d create these interfaces. Yep. At the same time, I think consumers um, are also trying to catch up with uh, all these interfaces and all these algorithms and all these platforms which are being optimized in a way that sometimes they can't quite wrap their heads around. Yeah. Uh, we've got a big feature coming up on technology addiction and, and just the levers that work upon people and how, how the mechanics work. Do you think that, you know, what do we need to do to educate consumers so that we can understand how to use these technologies maybe more responsibly? A few thoughts on that. You know, one is um, this, you know, remember the whole quantified self movement mm -hmm. and how it was really about exercise and weight gain and everything else, I think it's going to start to really shift towards attention management. Mm -hmm. This idea of, first of all, awareness being the first step, right? Wow, I spend that much time on Netflix or I spend that much time on Facebook or whatever it is. 
just seeing that knowledge merchandised to you in a particular way is probably this first step in, in starting to moderate and, and ask the tough questions of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, I have a, I have, I'm like starting to monitor my sleep just to kind of understand. I also have kids, so I'm like, okay, am I getting yeah. enough sleep? And it's interesting because you know, it's, it's the, the app that I'm using is telling me you're probably using a screen right before bed because it's interfering with deep sleep. I'm like, oh, that's a, it's interesting knowledge. It's a pretty safe with. assumption. Right, I guess, yeah, <laughs> duh, right? But it's, uh, I think that merchandising this information to you, even stuff that you might already you know, intuitively know, is, is, is important because it, it makes you feel pressured or guilty. Have you used Rescue Time? No, I haven't. Rescue Time's a great app. Yeah, it's, it's a desktop app, right? Desktop and mobile Oh, it's now. mobile now as well. So, and, it, and it gives you a weekly report of right. like, and you realize like, oh, I spent 50% of my time sending email. Yep. Like, that's what I do. That's my job. And you have to, so being aware and having the tracking mechanisms. And so there's fun, there's some interesting companies playing in that space, but until the platforms actually see it as one of their responsibilities, it has to almost be like native to the OS, I think, to get that level of granularity and insight that's truth. Um, the other thing I think about though is what are the what are the kind of ethical requirements of the designers of these products? Mm. Because again, a lot of this comes down to the designer. Yes, uh, businesses have objectives with selling ads and, and measuring themselves with KPIs for time and whatever on site and stuff like that. But what is you know what is the designer's responsibility here? We, there's this whole you know, line of thinking around dark patterns that designers use to get you to do things you don't really intend to do, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. What are the, and, and is there sort of some manifesto of uh, you know, a modern, modern day manifesto that designers need to adhere to to be building things they're you know, proud of? I would love to see that. Me too. I, and I think, there's a, I think there's a need for it. I think we're getting there. Yep. Uh, before you go, I want to ask you a couple questions I ask everybody that comes on the show. Sure. Um, is there a technology trend that concerns you the most, something that keeps you up at night? Technology trend? Yeah, I do think one thing that concerns me is, the, uh, is what the, how, we, um, how we take the news of how new technology that's being tested you know, goes awry and, and whether we keep the context of how that, you know, what that means in the, in whether it's a net gain or not for society as we know it. I mean, a perfect example is, um, is autonomous driving, for example, right? Uh, even if there are a hundred times more accidents, you know, that, that hurt people in manually driven cars. Um, we really blow up in the press anything that happens wrong with an autonomous vehicle. And, uh, and so if the facts are that it's actually safer, then, you know, how do we overcome the, 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 the phobia we have with new technology that might inherently inhibit, like, progress, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that applies to, like, all kinds of new tech, and AI is another one where we're, where we're all kind of thinking, okay, is this good or is this not good? But if you look at over the history of time, I mean, what always proves itself is that we're always scared at first. We ask the right questions. Those questions prevent, pr provide the right pressure to hopefully bring it into a you know, good direction. So I'm always up at night thinking, is that still true mm -hmm. or not? Has something changed? I don't think so. And if so, like, how do we have the productive conversation? Very good. Yeah, it's just happening today. There's a there was a Tesla crash in Florida, right. and by all indications, the they were the, they were just driving too fast. Yep. It's just a car crash. And you know. And there were 500 of them a day. Right. And this one was with, and it wasn't an autonomous vehicle. It was, but it was an electric vehicle. Yeah. No, it's a good point. Um, is there a, a technology or an innovation that you use every day that still inspires wonder? Hmm. A technology that still inspires wonder. Huh. I think. Uh, well, I mean, my answer is kind of simple, Wi-Fi. Yeah. I mean, I just can't get over the fact that everything we're doing, and I guess cellular networks to that extent, I mean, the fact that everything, everywhere we are is accessible to us whenever. I mean, that power in the palm of your hand, right? Does that ever get it's old? Pretty, it's pretty extraordinary. <laughs> it is. And the, the dissatisfaction when you can't get on, when there is no open Wi-Fi, oh, it's... and then you're like, oh, but at least I've got cellular. It's truly a utility, and we, we've tro totally started to take for granted the actually, you know, the things in our life, like not getting lost every time we mm -hmm. turn a block or whatever, uh, that are made possible. I was, uh, I had to find a restaurant in Brooklyn yesterday, and I had the voice commands going on my headphones, yeah. and it was literally, it just tells you when to turn right, right. when to turn left, and, um, and then it gave me the instruction, and then it would go back to my podcast. Yeah. So, uh, this so is talking about living yeah. in the future, and, right. like, and, it, and it was effortless yep. um, and free. Um, so how can people find you online and follow your work? 
Sure. No, um, so I'm easy to find. You know, Scott Belsky on, on Twitter is where I try to share some of the latest that I'm working on and things that are interesting to me. I'm actually coming out with a new book in October called The Messy Middle. So you oh, were there in the yeah. last book in 2010. So it's been eight years, but uh, The Messy Middle is all about some of the so the middle trauma that teams, whether they're at big companies like Adobe or independent founders, entrepreneurs have to overcome between their start and finish, the stuff that no one likes to talk about that kind of makes all the difference. So hopefully people will check that out as well. Yeah, you should come back on the show. We'll do a book uh, on lamps and maybe we'll hang out at uh, Soho House. Sounds Pretty good to me. <laughs> Very good. Scott, Great. thanks so much for coming on. Hey, good to see you, Dan. All right, you can find back episodes of Fast Forward on PCMag.com. You can also find them everywhere that fine podcasts are given away for free. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll see you in the future.